Kyle is the founder and managing partner of Westaway, a law, law firm for social entrepreneurs. He teaches social entrepreneurship at Harvard Law School and Cornell Tech. He's the author, author of Profit and Purpose and recently released the Entrepreneur's COVID-19 Playbook, a free 40-page guide to stimulus money, tax breaks, and legal tips to survive and thrive during the pandemic pandemic. Every Saturday morning, he sends out the weekend briefing, an email on how innovation is impacting society. And I just want to reiterate for all of you joining the call that I will be sending out a recap email um, to our entire SOCAP entrepreneur lister with all these resources that are mentioned during the call um, and anything else that Kyle would like to share with you, uh, including the playbook. So you will have access to all of that information. Great. Well, Sarah, thanks so much for having me. I, you know, I'm a huge fan of SOCAP and specifically the work you're doing with the social entrepreneurs is so important. And um, I'm glad to be here. And uh, I think my goal today is if I can help you guys walk away with just a little bit more clarity on um, how to think through this, um, this moment that we're in right now, um, I think that'll be a win. So um, we're going to, I'm going to start with a little bit of a presentation. <clears throat> And then going to move on to kind of more open Q and A, and um, hopefully that will uh, spark some really good conversation. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think we're going to have maybe 10, 15 minutes on, on the upfront of kind of uh, my presentation and Sarah and I's question, questions and answers, um, and then we'll kind of open up to a big, the, the larger questions and answers. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen here. All right. Okay. Can you guys see that? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So I um, am just going to walk through some highlights today. And what I've chosen to focus on is uh, PPP, because that seems to be uh, what's um, working with social entrepreneurs myself. And from the research I've done is the most um, interesting, popular, and uh, most used program of the stimulus. There's some other stuff out there. We can certainly get to in the Q&A if you want to, um, but this first part of the presentation is gonna focus on uh, PPP. So what is this program? The Payroll Protection Program. Here's the quick breakdown of it. Uh, PPP is a, uh, it's a loan to small businesses. Um, the goal is, um, problem that's trying to be solved through PPP is how can we ensure that people stay on the payroll during this hopefully momentary um, downtime for our economy. So that's the idea of it is to put money into businesses so businesses don't have to lay people off um, even when they're shut down. Um, and so how does it work? Well first I want to say this is how much money has been put into the program thus far in two tranches. Second tranche was signed into uh, into law on Friday of last week, April 24th. And um, the first amount of funding went really, really quickly. We're going to get to some stats on how, how the money was spent and how um, entrepreneurs were able to access that money in a bit. Um, but the total amount of money thus far that has been, um, that has been appropriated to the PPP program is $660 billion. Um, there is possibility, and I would, if I were going to make a bet, probability that there'd be at least another tranche of funding coming for PPP, but we'll get there, get to that in a minute. Um, so how do I know if I'm running a, if I'm an entrepreneur or running a small business, how do I know if I'm eligible for the PPP program? Um, here are three kind of quick bullet points. If you fit under one of these, um, then you're probably eligible. The eligibility is pretty broad. Um, so if you're not a huge business, which you're probably not on this call, if you're a huge business, um, then you're probably eligible. So it's a small business or a nonprofit with 500 or less employees. Interestingly, um, after the program was initially launched, there was clarification that you can in fact apply if you're an independent contractor or a sole proprietor. Um, and in either case, you need to have been in operation on February 15th, 2020. So if you meet those criteria, um, then you're, you're probably eligible. So again, this is a loan. This is a loan from uh, the government. It is uh, specifically from the F SBA. 
And um, so what are the terms of that loan? The terms are pretty simple, uh, actually really simple for a, gov for a government program. It's surprisingly straightforward. Um, the amount that you can borrow is based on the amount of payroll that you have. And for a simple back of the envelope number, if you spend, if you spend $100 every month on payroll, you can get, you can apply for a loan of up to $250. So 2.5 times what your monthly payroll costs are. Those payroll costs include the actual payroll money, taxes, benefits, anything else that's put into a compensation package for your employees are included in that, in that principal calculation. So uh, again, it's 2.5 times your monthly payroll um, one note is that if you have employees that are making over a hundred grand a year, um, it's only um, going to be calculating their um, annualized 100 grand. So if they make 200 grand, you're only going to get payroll. You're only able to add a hundred grand of that into the, uh, into the calculation. Um, it's a loan with an interest of 1% um, in a, a, a term of two years. So pretty, pretty clean, pretty straightforward. Um, Unlike some other uh, programs that the SBA has, there's no personal guarantee required. So that means that you don't have to personally sign um, that you will personally um, be on the hook if your company is not able to pay this off. Uh, I think which is huge. A lot of small businesses are very uh, rightfully so very leery of taking on debt that they have to personally guarantee. Mm -hmm. And Kyle, there is a question um, just in terms of the current status in, of, of this PPP uh, mm -hmm. program, if funds are still available, people have been s chatting that, you know, um, like round one versus round two, can you give any sort of insight into that? Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, you know what, I want to answer that question. Let's do that in about a minute. Is that okay? I think that the, we, we'll, we'll have some, I have some slides, kind of a couple slides down the line that will be a little bit more speaking to that particular point. Um, I just wanna get people on, this, on the right page of what, what this program is. Okay, so um, this loan is forgivable under certain circumstances. And um, the circumstances are that you use it for authorized purposes, which are payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent, and utility payments, um, and that you deploy that capital within eight weeks. Um, if you, uh, and you keep people employed during that eight weeks. If you reduce your employee headcount um, as compared against your average headcount, then um, you will reduce the amount that you will be forgiven by that amount. So if you normally have uh, 10 people on your payroll and you have to lay off one person within that, those eight weeks, um, your forgivable amount will be reduced by 10%, if that makes sense. Um, and then lastly, how do you apply? Um, you, the way that this program is being put together is that the application is through banks that are SBA lenders. Um, it's also through some FinTech companies such as Cabbage and PayPal among others. Um, and typically the application process has been online um, and a pretty straightforward form when the bank's sites are up and operational, which, is a, uh, which has been a, a pretty big issue. Um, but the main thing is that the, the banks can process these loan applications, but it doesn't matter unless the actual capital is there um, from the SBA's end. So um, this leads to the question that we had earlier. Um, how is it going? How is the program progressing at this point in time? And I would say that um, not so hot is the answer. <laughs> um, there is a, um, uh, a lot of frustration on the side of entrepreneurs. I, um, I, I, I run a law firm that works with early and growth stage social entrepreneurs. And so I'm um, hearing that firsthand from my clients. And then I've also done some uh, work, just some survey work around the field. Um, and I uh, put a survey out and had 127 uh, entrepreneurs fill out the survey to let me know kind of what their experience with the PPP is. And the, if I could summarize the experience in one word, it would be frustration. 
There's a lot of frustration out there about um, opacity of the process and uh, uh, both in how, how you actually, who you should be applying with and how their application process works. And then secondly, how each applicant is prioritized or not. Um, and there's a lot of um, underlying frustration there and I, we can certainly talk about that if we want to. But I just wanna give you some data that I learned from, from doing this survey about how it's going. Um, so the banks estimate that it will probably take $1 trillion to fund all of the applications that are in the pipeline right now. If you remember from our slide earlier, there's been about $660 billion appropriated thus far. Um, so if the banks are being honest with the amount of applications that are in their pipeline, um, there's still a pretty significant shortfall of, uh, you know, we barely are over half of the applications will be funded. So there's a huge question of whether um, this, how much um, gap this, this next tranche, which was just put into play on Friday and started kind of flowing on Monday, um, there's a big question about how much need that will fill and how quickly it will be tapped. Um, and we don't know that data just yet. Um, what we do know kind of from the research that, that I did is that from our small pool of 127 entrepreneurs, 18.2% um, were funded. So that's um, over 80% were not funded. Um, that number probably is a little bit higher now as the survey was done last week. Um, and I've got some emails trickling in saying that people have been funded. So let's assume it grew to 20%. Still about, eight, eight, uh, still about 80 percent of applicants haven't been funded. If our, um, if our data is representative, I don't know if it is of the, of the whole, that's a pretty small uh, drop in the bucket. Um, and just to give you a kind of a insight of how, uh, how much people are generally applying for, um, this is kind of the breakdown of the, within our, our subset of people that we surveyed, um, the dollar amounts of the PPP loans being requested. You can see a, uh, almost half of the loans are under 50K um, and very few of them are over a million dollars. Um, so at least within our subset, these are real small businesses. There's been a lot of critique about um, businesses that qualify under the SBA rules as small businesses, but are publicly traded or are pretty big, uh, you know, in terms of revenue and headcount. Um, and they are the ones that are getting those loans that are on the five to 10 million um, or million dollars and above. And there's some critique about um, whether or not they, they should be. SBA has clarified some rules um, as of uh, Friday to say that if you're taking out a loan, beware that we may check into whether you actually need that loan. Um, and they specifically use an example of the publicly traded small business that is taking PPP money. Um, so hopefully uh, we have seen some of that money returned and hopefully we'll see some more of that so um, that it can flow to some more real small businesses. I'm showing my bias here, uh, but uh, that's, that's my perspective. Uh, so just, just in case you guys are super curious and want, want to learn more, I've put together a spreadsheet that's sortable by size of company, by nonprofit, for-profit, um, by bank that they applied for, and, uh, and by whether or not they're approved. So you can sort by a bunch of different functions. You can maybe even look at your bank and see how many people have been approved from the bank that, that, you, that you bank with. Um, if you're a data geek, you may want to get in there and sort and play around. And this is a, um, where I've put that data up publicly so you guys can play with it. Um, and then we can probably throw this in the email afterwards if, if people are interested in, in digging further. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna stop there and maybe start moving into some of the questions, um, Sarah, that, that you, you kind of have queued, queued up here. Perfect. So um, one, of, one of the first questions uh, that I'm seeing comes from Sean and said, uh, if you have not demonstrated revenue or reported a loss in 2020, are you still el eligible for either program as an S Corp? Assuming you were in existence before 2020, but maybe that's, maybe that's what they're saying, they haven't been in existence? 
or if you haven't, you just haven't demonstrated revenue or, or reported a loss in 2020 is the question. So, um, yeah, if yeah. You, it, so the, the, the look back period for, um, for PPP is, um, f from February, 2008, from February, 2019 to February, 2020. Um, or just your your financials for the year 2019. So if this person is asking, we had a good year in 2019 and 2020, we haven't done much of anything, um, that's gonna be mm -hmm. fine. If they didn't exist before 2020, um, they are probably not going to be able to access PPP money. Okay, yeah, and they're, they're in existence prior to 2020, so I think that answers um, his question as well. Um, and then there's a couple of questions around, you know, what uh, round one versus round two looks like. Some people didn't mm -hmm. get money in round one, but they're in line yep. for the next yep. round. Um, and SBA is limiting the number of applications by large banks. Just what are you hearing or what are even in for the participants in this group? Like what are other people hearing? And is there a line? <laughs> what does that look like? Yeah, it's still unclear how prioritization is happening at each bank, right? Um, and there is there have been lawsuits around um, banks seemingly prioritizing larger loans as as opposed to smaller loans. Um, it's unclear whether uh, well, I will say one judge has ruled that that is an okay thing to do. Um, it's unclear whether that will um, be the in the end be the the truth whether or not they they were able to do that or not um so taking that aside um each bank seems to have their own process for who they're processing you'd like to think it would it could just be a first come first serve um it doesn't seem that that's happening but there's no clear data one way or the other on on how that's happening as far as first tranche versus second tranche if you've applied for ppp under the under the first tranche, you do not need to reapply. You're at, you are in the queue at your at your lender, um, and it will be processed in the same way that they process everything else. Um, they just will have an, another plug of money to uh, to pull in from. Um, okay. The I felt like there's one more sub question there, but uh, did I did I hit all the questions there, Sarah? Or did I miss something? I think I think that answers everyone's questions. I want to just make sure Neil for Neil Newman if that answers his questions because he had another sort of um, in terms of there's been adjustments made to the PPP program so that actual yeah. small businesses would access the loans. How effective do you think those changes will be in getting money to well, the businesses that actually need it? But <laughs> I, I think that as I alluded to, that there is more clarity on on. Uh, that specifically seems to be targeted at larger small businesses. Um, and so I think that that will, uh, what the most recent treasury guidance uh, on Friday said, is that if you take this money, you are, we want to remind you that you're certifying that you have uh, economic need for these loans. And uh, the, uh, what, what the treasury has said is, for example, if you're a publicly traded small business, um, we may come back and ask you to certify, and we may ask to come and look at your books to see if you actually have financial need for this loan. They also said, if you want to return the money before May 7th, we will call it all good, no harm, no foul. Um, but if, if you keep the loan after May 7th, then we, are, we will um, look into your books to see if there's a real economic need here. The other thing too that is a, kind of a sub point that maybe is worth mentioning is that um, a certain chunk of PPP this time around was, uh, I believe that was uh, 60 billion, um, was earmarked for um, smaller and community banks. The hope here is, though I don't know if this is actually true or not, um, the hope here is that uh, folks that have harder time uh, don't have relationships with big banks or have harder times creating um, banking relationships that they're, um, these smaller banks may be able to serve them better. I don't know if that's true or not. The data I've seen, I just saw one quick report that said the likelihood of people of color uh, accessing PPP funds are significantly lower 
due to a couple different things. And they kind of extrapolated um, uh, those business owners that are people of color that have significant and consistent banking relationships r relative to the rest of the population. And they extrapolated out that there's a pretty significant uh, disadvantage to being a person of color to access these programs. Great, and then a, one more clarifying question is sort of, is there is there a line to be funded or do they put everyone in the same pool? If I apply tomorrow, do I get the same fair treatment as someone that applied three weeks ago, for example? Um, I, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, the Each bank seems to have their own way of prior, prioritizing. And so um, my answer would, my guess would be that um, you'll be in the same criteria that that, that bank uses. So if Chase of America, Bank of America or Chase has their system, you'll be put in the system in the same way that anybody else would. Um, there's no reason not to apply at this point in time if you haven't applied yet. If you have applied, it's kind of unfortunately a little bit of a cross your fingers and, and hope. I do know that a, a number of folks are um, making applications at a major bank, for instance, and then also a fintech company to see which process works through quicker. You obviously can't accept, but uh, you know, if you get funded on both, you can't accept both. You have to take it from one or the other. Um, otherwise, that would be fraud, which we would not want you guys to uh, to commit. And for independent contractors, do you have a good feel as to what they report in terms of payroll since most don't have payroll per se? Yeah, um, so you, they'll be looking back at your um, past uh, 1099 Schedule C as the, as the document to understand um, how much money you, you've, you've made. Um, and I actually have, I've got, well, We'll, we'll let these questions pull, uh, finish up because I've got a couple more that I've been hearing a lot of and this touches on one of those questions. I can get into a little bit Great. more detail. Yeah. And the last, the last little mini question before we launch into the, the next section of the q and is, uh, can you apply to more than one bank? Yes, you can apply to more than one bank. You can't accept from more than one bank. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so if, if I own a business, Kyle, but I don't take a salary, can I still apply? If so, how do I calculate payroll? <laughs> yeah, this is a great question. I'm going to pull back up my presentation for this. Um, cause this is one that has been, um, uh, lots of people have been asking. Boom, there's the question right there. Um, so if you run an LLC or an S Corp and generally pay yourself not through payroll, but through distributions, you can count that towards your total payroll costs for purposes of calculating loan size. Uh, you'll need supporting documentation to prove this. This is kind of guidance from Treasury is saying this. The question I think that individual banks are having is, what document is what documentation is enough documentation to show that there that this is actually true? And uh, one email I got actually this morning, you know, a couple hours ago, was noting that a an S corp that does pays themselves through distributions and takes a low salary um, made the application. They were funded, um, and the one thing that was a, a wrinkle in their kind of process was. What documents should we rely on to prove that you actually were paying yourself this much? Um, they used their K-1, and it helped that they were doing these distributions on a regular basis, that it wasn't just ad hoc. It seemed to help. Um, but the bank required them to sign a lot of forms saying that we are not taking responsibility if, if in the end, the SBA and Treasury chooses to say, that this is not proper documentation. We are not taking any liability for um, using, relying upon this documentation. So I think that banks are a little bit leery, um, but we have been hearing folks in this position get funded. 
So that's that's good news. Uh, I think each bank will take take their own process for for how they uh, answer that. And we do we do have a couple more um, questions coming in that are a little more at there about sort of eligibility. Um, if you were if you were in operation in 2019, but you had no yep. revenue, but you had sweat equity, um, like entrepreneur sweat, are you eligible? Meaning sweat equity as in four partners plus legal costs plus one consultant to to total six employees. Yeah, it's, um, it calculates on how much the business is paying out to people. Um, so the answer is no. If you if you don't have any proof that you have been paying people. They don't calculate, they're not in the business of calculating how much sweat equity is worth in your, in your company. So um, the answer is uh, unfortunately no on that one, my understanding. And, um, is there an easy way to for people to check the eligibility of the stimulus check and like to see if they're eligible? Um, stimulus check, I just wanna make sure that we're not talking about something else now because they're, yeah, are those, is that something different than PPP? I just wanna make sure I know what we're talking about. I'll wait. It's an anonymous attendee. I, I think it's there's two different things. Um, and then if yeah, you previously I know that the, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Chris. I'll, I'll just yeah, I'll just say just one quick note on that. If I think I understand the question properly, um, there is the personal stimulus check. People are calling the stimulus check um, of twelve hundred dollars that is being cut to individuals, not to companies, um, and that is all based on how much income you earned. And there's a sliding scale of how much um, of that you'll receive. Uh, and um, I don't know those numbers off the top of my head, but I do think that once you get to 150 of, if you've earned 150 or more, I believe, you get zero and there's a sliding scale down. Um, yeah, that's my understanding of how it works. And if you've previously applied for PPP through, for example, a fintech company or have signed a loan document, does that mean you're funded or is it just another step in underwriting? Um, well, it would depend what that document is. Um, but if the, if the document is that uh, you have been approved, um, here are the terms, uh, here is the term of the loan, here's the promissory note that you need to sign, um, then you've, you've been, um, you have been, approved by your lender and oftentimes they won't get to that step unless they actually have the funding to fund um, i typically speaking once you have that step and if the company if the funding is in place um there the treasury rules state that it shouldn't be more than a 10-day gap between approval and uh, actual the, the funds hitting your account mm -hmm. Um, and at what time should I start closing more, more, oh, sorry, that's a different question. So, um, what happens if I have to let go of employees after the eighth week? This is kind of yeah, our next general, question. I think this will help answer a lot of people's questions that are coming in right now. What if I have to let employees go after the eighth week? Um, the, uh, it's a good question. The, the terms, as I understand them on PPP, um, dictate how you spend uh, the PPP capital and um, how you spend it determines how much of it is forgiven, right? So if I take a loan out for $100 and um, I spend all of that $100 in an appropriate way, then $100 of that $100 will be forgiven. If I don't spend it in an appropriate way, there's a smaller chunk of that that will be forgiven, meaning I will have to pay off the rest of it. So um, the, one of the terms is that you have to keep the same headcount uh, as your average headcount from last year um, or more in order to have that loan amount forgiven. So and the time frame they have in that is for eight weeks. Um, the idea here is hopefully two and a half months of payroll will allow you to pay people for two months and, uh, and have a little bit of uh, extra money to pay for other authorized costs. And, um, but if you take the money, then you cut people right away, then you have to pay back essentially the whole thing. Um, after the eighth week, the clock stops. And with the look back period for forgivabilities purposes, 
is those eight weeks. So they care about what you did with that money, how you spent it within those eight weeks. And if you spend it properly, and then on the ninth week, you're like, we tried, we did the best we could to keep people employed, but now we're not able to anymore. Um, you're not going to be penalized for the activities that you take, laying off people, et cetera, on the ninth week. Great. I want to just check in with the, all of our participants to see if there's any, any final questions, comments. And there, like there are two more frequently asked questions that, that I have, Sarah, if you want me to queue those up. Yeah, please. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so the, another popular question is, is it possible to qualify for loans under both the PPP and EIDL? We have not talked about EIDL at all on this call. I'm just going to make a quick note of it. And if there are other questions that are sparked from this, please put them in the chat. Um, EIDL is Economic uh, Injury Disaster Loans. Um, and it is a loan program also by the SBA. It's an existing loan program that didn't start from the CARES Act that had existed beforehand. Um, it have, it's historically been used in times of like natural disasters, et cetera. Um, the short, short, short of this is that typically for most entrepreneurs, the EIDL is not as favorable as PPP because that none of the EIDL um, loan amount that if, if you're approved, none of the loan amount is forgivable. So the great thing about the PPP is you could walk away with not having to owe any money back to the government, which is a huge thing for small business. EIDL, um, you should think of as a more long-term um, long solution. And it is a loan that is um, a, can be up to 30 year loan uh, term and is um, at a low interest rate, but you have to pay it back all of it. Um, you can apply for both EIDL and PPP but you cannot use the funds from both loans for the same purposes. Um, and the way that you'd want to use the funding is use PPP funds for payroll and then use EIDL for non-payroll costs. Um, if the EIDL is used for payroll costs, your PPP amount will have to be used uh, to refinance the EIDL. You don't want to get into that. If you take both, keep, keep those separated and use PPP only for payroll purposes. Um, okay, yeah, and here's another popular one that, that I've been getting a ton of. My business uses independent contractors, not employees. Can I count their wages as payroll? Um, my business does too, great question. And the, the answer is that no, you're not allowed to count the amount of money you're spending on independent contractors as payroll. Um, however, the SBA allows independent contractors themselves to apply for PPP. Um, so my recommendation, I literally was working with a client on this three hours ago. Um, my recommendation is to, for the business owner, is to help your 1099 independent contractors work through the application process, make sure that they can apply for uh, that PPP capital themselves. Um, and then they'll have, you know, eight weeks worth of, of uh, payment coming to them from the government directly. I think that's all of my FAQs. Yeah, I think that's right. And there is a couple of questions sparked from, <laughs> from those two FAQs, Kyle, so thank yep. you so much. With um, um, the first one is going into a little bit more of, um, you know, if I don't have a commercial lender or someone like that at, at, at my bank to walk me through the process of what I can do, right. where, where can I get this assistance? Where are there other resources? Right. Well, first of all, my understanding is it is incredibly hard to get a commercial banker on the phone these days. So I want to say you're not alone. And it's very, uh, it's very normal. Most people I know that have applied for this haven't talked to a banker at all. Um, interestingly, some of the folks at, uh, that have had an existing relationship at a small community bank have actually been able to have a human work, work with them through the process. But I just want to say that that's the exception, not, not the rule. And um, the applications themselves are pretty, are fairly straightforward, fortunately. Um, I've seen uh, a lot of them from a lot of different banks and it's not, it, it's, uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out how to answer these questions. Um, it's a pretty simple online form to fill out. Um, 
as far as resources to understand and, and understand how to calculate. Specifically, there's questions around how do you calculate payroll. Um, some of, if you have a payroll provider, for instance, if you're working with Gusto or if you're working um, with JustWorks or somebody like that, um, they oftentimes will have a downloadable packet that you can use for PPP purposes, um, which is a really nice resource. Um, and then uh, I would say that the, uh, the playbook that we put together has a, a lot more granularity than our talk has given today. Um, and the feedback that we've been getting from thousands of people is that it's actually readable. You can actually understand it. So um, I would recommend those two resources. And then with the EIDL, wasn't the first 10,000 forgivable or given mm -hmm. as a grant? <laughs> There's a lot of confusion around this. Um, the answer is, I think the intent was that that is true. And there is a, the amount of people that um, have been like really pissed off because they're like, where's my free $10,000? Um, because that is definitely the way that it was marketed um, at the outset. Um, does not match the reality, which is that they surprise, surprise, free money is really popular. And so they're, they were pretty overwhelmed with the system and they, what they ended up doing is saying that, um, okay, so this, this $10,000 grant um, is the way we're going to apply that is that there is a, we will max it out at 10,000 and it will be 1,000 per employee that you have. Um, and um, there's a question, around whether if you get approved, whether or not that 10K is rolled into the overall principle of the loan or it's not. I think the intent was that it's not, but um, I don't have enough data to know that if that's how it's actually being executed. Hmm. Perfect. And what is, what is the maximum amount for PPP and for EIDL? Is it 2 million or is it 10 million or is it 20 million? Um, We've heard all three of these possibilities as possibilities. Yeah, um, I I am trying to remember EIDL, and I don't remember that off the top of my head. Um, for PPP, it's max of ten million. Ten million max on PPP, and that's all based on payroll costs. So you'd have to be a pretty big company to have payroll costs. Uh, you know, two and a half of your months that, that puts you at like four million dollar a month payroll something like that um, or 3.5 million dollar a month payroll um, so you could max out there but it's you'd have to be a pretty big company to hit the max So um, I just want to note to everyone to get in their final questions now, since we have Kyle as a captive audience here, <laughs> we, have a, we have a specific one um, from Tivan uh, about sort of um, if, if the damage to coronavirus is not today's cash, but loss of a contract and that had future value and the loss net present value is significant um, of a, like a $5 million loss in present value. Uh, sure. Can that count as a loss or cost or disaster? Uh, if so, what discount rate do we use to recognize this loss in today's value? Um, I'm unclear what that, that uh, is in reference. Yeah. Is that is just like, is this how I adjust the, uh, the like, is this a financial question about how, how this reflects in the valuation of my company? Yes, yeah, so yeah. basically, um, they said I have, uh, yes. Yes, basically. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, the answer is any shot at answering that that I would be giving would be just like taking a taking a shot. I'm probably not the guy you want to turn to to run your books. Um, so I'm going to pass mm -hmm. on that one. Uh, just realizing my circle of competence and realizing that that's here and I'm here. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I know this is just speculating, but do you have a feel for as to whether there will be a third tranche for PPP? It is speculation, and I, I do have a feel. I'm betting yes. Um, I, I just, I, um, again, surprisingly, free money is, is really popular, and uh, 
uh, it tends to play well to both Republicans and Democrats right now. Um, so there's no constituents are overwhelmingly in support of this. And that means that senators and, and congressmen are as well. Um, we'll see if that, that support wanes. It's really interesting <clears throat> to me as if I can give a side tangent that uh, there is, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely in a very Keynesian moment right now. And the amount of money that we're printing is insane. Um, and it's really interesting that it's happening under a conservative, quote unquote, conservative government, although that's uh, from an economics perspective, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see this amount of money being printed. I think it's going to um, be really interesting to see globally how this impacts all of our economies. We're all um, Keynesians now. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and for that, if you were to speculate for a third tranche, any idea of how much that might be? <laughs> Pure well, speculation? Um, yeah, well, let's keep speculating, right? Why not? Um, so all the first tranche was around uh, 350, second tranche was 310. And so I, I'm, and I would imagine a third tranche would be in the 300s as well. We'll see, and it's kind of see how far that, that gets you. They just want to really... The, the unemployment numbers are spiking like crazy right now, like we've never seen before in history. Um, and we want, they just want to do everything they can to blunt those numbers. And this is one way to do it. And um, I have a accrued cost to pay people in 2019 and in January, 2020. Can I use this as proof of paying employees and can that and can then do their 2.5 x their cost of four ppp is the question i don't know if that makes so sense they, they, um, i think what i'm hearing is that they they're they've accrued costs but they haven't paid them so they've accrued payroll yeah, costs but they haven't paid those payroll costs and i don't know how that's documented i would guess that the answer would be uh that i would be very doubtful that a bank would would rely on that as proof of of salary um so i i would say it's, it's unlikely typically you see like a w3 or a 1040 uh, 1041 or 1044 form uh, or a um a report from your payroll provider as the key documents that that are being used um, so I, I would be surprised if, if that would, if that would work. And, um, just in terms of your own, uh, perspective based on your, your experience, how do you believe small businesses will fare coming out of this? Do you expect that most mm. will survive? No, I don't expect most will survive. Um, uh, most, I expect, I expect most will survive. I expect more than half will survive. Um, I, I, I think that there will be a good chunk that will not, um, and, and I have no doubt that a lot will downsize, become a little bit more lean and understand a little bit better about where they can actually make their revenue. Um, and it'll take a while for them to hire back up. Um, what I've been seeing just kind of rough, rough numbers is about a 30% hit on most kind of small businesses that we're working with. Uh, to revenue, and it depends on how fat your margins are, and um, how kind of lean, lean or not lean your cushion is, um, as to whether that will mean headcount reduction for your company. But I think expecting thirty percent or more reduction in revenue is a really good expectation. And kind of, Kyle, just finally, finally to sort of start wrapping up our conversation today, I'd love to hear from you just any sort of uh, final thoughts and insights that you have that you think would be uh, useful uh, to share with the group. Sure. I, I guess I just want to say um, that uh, if you're on this call and you're a business owner, um, this is a pretty uncertain time, which brings up a lot of fear and um, I think it is easy to uh, make snap judgments or um, um, make decisions out of fear in this moment. Um, I think that the people that will um, survive and thrive in the long term will be able to take a breath and ask the questions 
What am I actually delivering to my clients? What's the value that we're actually creating? How can we do that better even in this moment than we have in the past? Uh, and I think the folks that are able to answer that question will survive and will will be stronger when this whole whole thing dies down. Um, and so those are the key questions. Obviously, the question of of that we've been talking about today is a very tactical question, which is how do I keep people paid in the in the meantime? Very real and practical question. I think the bigger questions are how can I provide value? How can I show to my client, to my customer? that um, what we're doing is adding value to their life. Um, so I, I, I'd say the question to be focused on is that right now. Mm -hmm. And any sort of final thoughts in terms of, of um, just reiterating resources where people can go, sure. um, other sort of financial support for, you mentioned the independent contractors, just to, to reiterate that yeah. for the group. Yeah, as far as resources go, um, there, this is a uh, uh, warning plug coming. Um, I'm about to plug my own stuff. So um, the, uh, this, this playbook that we've put together is, is a really good resource, it's free, and it's, it's pretty in depth. It talks about uh, PPP, which we talked about today, EIDL, um, and it talks about uh, tax and a little bit of legal stuff as well. So it's a pretty good bundle and pretty skimmable and you can dive into sections that are meaningful to you. But I bring that up as a good starting point. The reason why I bring that up is because if you will have a link that you can go to to download that, if you go there and download that, you'll also be put on a mini little email that I'm putting together with all of the updates as they're coming out. Typically two emails a week of like the new stuff that is important for you to know. So um, the stuff in the playbook is good, it's solid, but it's also stale in some ways. Um, so the, the, the benefit of signing up is that you get the, the fresh content as it's coming out in fresh analysis. Um, so that would be, that would be, I think the resource that I would point you to, to give you both the basis and the most current news. If you don't feel like going um, to SBA's then, site and clicking refresh and then reading through their PDFs, <laughs> I can do that for you. Yeah, exactly. And I think just a final question from, you know, uh, us at Intentional Media and, and SOCAP and, and Spectrum and all the things that are coming up, uh, the events that are coming up mm -hmm. that we will share in our recap email as well so you guys get all the information and resources for upcoming events and webinars. Um, I'd love to just hear from you any sort of insight in terms of how you think uh, in a positive way, this whole situation is going to benefit the ecosystem and maybe benefit small businesses in the long run, just to kind of end in, end in sort of a positive, a positive <laughs> note <laughs> as well. Find, you're asking me, Kyle, find the silver lining, please. Um, you know, I, yeah. I do, I, my, my hope, <laughs> my hope is that this, um, this moment will allow, um, a resurgent in a resurgence in conscious consumption that there will be a higher level of intentionality and thinking in our purchases coming out of this uh, maybe we'll be consuming less uh, but maybe consuming better is kind of is kind of my hope and that um, it will allow uh, consumers clients to ask the question of like where who are the valuable companies that I do want to kind of give my dollar to if there are less dollars to go around how do I want to how do I want to spend my money um, to the extent that we can be an answer to that I think that that's a that's a huge competitive advantage truthfully coming out of this perfect well um, thank you so much Kyle we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today again we my will pleasure. be uh, sharing all of these resources presentation with everyone who's participated in the call and people who weren't able to who RSVP'd. Um, also just a shout out, you know, if you have, if any of you have an idea for a small virtual event for our series, uh, please email us at info at socialcapitalmarkets.net. We'll also include that shout out in our recap email. Um, so thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you for everyone who was able to attend today. Um, and we look forward to, to being in touch and using all of the resources that you presented during the call. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Kyle. Have Thanks, a good Sarah. rest of the Thanks, day. Carrie. Thanks, everyone. Thank yeah. you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.